Well, friends, I'm uh, going to share this morning from the thought, some things are worth the wait, and uh, two scripture passages for you, one from the book of Hebrews, uh, verses 27 and 28, it's going to be the main text. In addition to that, it's going to be uh, two to three more verses um, within Hebrews and the, from the book of Isaiah, Isaiah 53, very familiar passage of scripture. Can uh, we bring up the Isaiah text now, and uh, what we'll do is read the scripture and then go to the Lord in prayer and uh, get to the meat of the message. So listen carefully to these words. Uh, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes we are healed. Wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. It's Isaiah 53, verses 4 and 5. And now for uh, Hebrews uh, chapter 9, verses 12 through 14, listen carefully to these words. He did not enter, he referring to Jesus, by means of the blood of goats and cows, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer heifer, sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse cleanse our consciences from the acts that lead to death, so that we may serve the living God. Just as people are destined to die once, here's the main text, and after that to face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many. And he will appear a second time not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are, catch this, waiting for him, waiting for him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to Almighty God. Let us just bow our heads for a brief moment of prayer. Gracious God, we do thank you so much for uh, this moment to receive a word from you. We do invoke and invite a special anointing uh, to rest, rule, and abide within our ears and hearts that we may uh, be open and available to all of what your Holy Spirit wants to offer us this day. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart Be pleasing and acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, you are my rock and my radical redeemer. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray, amen, amen. Some things are worth the wait. Friends, the story was told of this uh, bartender who had worked long, long hours and was ready for a weekend break, and so he said to himself, "Uh, I'm going to knock off two hours early today. And a gentle, small voice says, no, you need to hang in there and do your full shift, and thank God he did. Uh, The last 15 minutes of that shift, Uh, A guy walked up to the bar and ordered a pina colada. And so he made his drink, gave him his drink. He was just uh, tanning around the pool deck, got his drink and began to walk back. And he accidentally tripped over a chair and fell into the pool. And the bartender at first chuckled a little bit um, at this sight and uh, realized this guy isn't coming back up. And so he jumped over the counter and jumped into the pool and he rescued this guy, pulled him out of the pool and began to perform uh, CPR on him. And this guy started spitting up all this water and uh, pina colada. And so when he finally got his bearings back, he says, um, uh, 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 what do I tip you for something like that? And the bartender says, well, what do you mean, for the pina colada or for your life? Friends, I tell you that story (laughs) for several reasons. First of all, some things are worth the wait. Thank God that bartender had it in him to wait and to stay his post. Amen? And the second reason why I tell you that, because it brings to light a very important question that we should ask God every day. Lord, what can I give you today for saving my life? What can I give you today? For saving my life. How many of you realize everything and all that we have comes from the Lord? The air that we breathe, the food that we eat, even the intelligence that is required to to work a business or to serve on a job, it all comes from the Lord. Psalms 24 says it this way, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. So everything comes from God. Amen, church? Everything that we have, everything that we supposedly own, 
God has just entrusted it, entrusted it to us for a season. But it all comes ultimately from the Lord. And the reason, I, the, the additional reason of why I told, shared that story with you is it, because it reveals a series of events that we find in Hebrews. First of all, this bartender entered the pool. He didn't just enter the pool. He offered himself by way of saving this man. And he obtained from this man, he obtained from that situation this man's life. He entered, he offered, and he obtained. We find the same series, if you will, in, uh, throughout verses 12 through 15 in the book of Hebrews. What do you mean, David? Well, Jesus entered into the perfect tabernacle, the one that was not made by hands. Hebrews is uh, known for its classical theology by way of the Old Testament and the outdated uh, 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 priests who would bring sacrifices on behalf of the community. They would sacrifice bulls and goats, and they would take uh, the, bull, uh, the blood from that and offer it, sprinkle it, and it was a sacrifice to, to ask for pardon for their sins and the sins of their community. Well, Jesus didn't enter in heaven by way of uh, 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 the blood that comes from a bull or a goat. No, he entered into heaven by his very own blood. Did you catch that? So he entered, and while he was there, he offered himself. He offered himself as the sacrificial lamb of God. John notes in scripture, uh, behold the lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. Jesus was the sacrificial lamb of God, and he offered himself as such. And finally and thirdly, he then obtained for us something very special and important. Well, David, what did he obtain for us? He obtained for us redemption and salvation, the forgiveness of our sins. And he obtained for us the right to have access now to the Father. Amen, church? That's really shouting news. I don't see anyone shouting, but that's some good news this morning, isn't it? That's good news because it really speaks to the magnitude that when Jesus died on the cross, he died for our past sins. He died for our present sins. And he also died for our future sins. That's good news, church. He died for your past sins, your present sins, and your future sins. The Bible says while we were yet sinners, he died for us. Past, present, and future. And so what does that mean? I mean, what, 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 did, what else did he obtain? Well, he obtained salvation. He obtained salvation, and through salvation, we became saved from the, the penalty of sin, the power of sin, and the practice of sin. It's good news. The penalty of sin, the power of sin, and the practice of sins. Well, well David, when you talk about salvation, what does that really mean? Well, let me tell you through, 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 through a metaphor, through a story. It's really connected to the history of the Methodist church. Do you all know John Wesley? He is the founder of the Methodist church. John Wesley was one of 19 kids. I don't know what was in the drinking water back in those days, but Susanna had 19 kids, and John Wesley was one of 19 kids. And as the story goes, one day the rectory caught on fire. It was really Samuel and Su uh, Susanna were his parents. Samuel was a pastor. One of the members, don't you try this with me now, became disgruntled with Samuel and set their house on fire. Everyone was out except John Wesley. He was on the second floor. And so quickly they developed what's called a, a human ladder. That's when you get on each other's shoulder. And they plucked him from the fire in just the nick of time. Read your history books. It's, it's, that's Methodist history. Okay? So he's known now as a brand plucked from the fire. That's Methodist history. And voila, today we have the Methodist church. Do you think they realized that they were saving a church such as the Methodist church? But here's where I'm going with this. Salvation is really the transaction involving the taking away of a need in exchange of fulfillment. It's the taking away of a problem in exchange for the giving of a solution. And that's what Jesus did on the cross for you and I when he died. He was giving us a transaction. He was exchanging our sins for salvation. He was exchanging our faults and our flaws and our failures for forgiveness and redemption and eternal life. Salvation is a transaction involving the taking away of a need and the giving of fulfillment. The taking away of a problem and the giving of a solution. 
So once again, you've been saved from the penalty of sin, the power of sin, and the practice of sin. Now, that, that's all well and good, David. That's classical theology. That's what Jesus did on the cross for you and I. But David, that's up on the cross. And that's Jesus dealing with our sin issue. Amen, church? What about the 5.4 million that are out of power right now? What about the precious lives that were lost just this past week? What about the power lines that are still down and the floodwaters that are still up? What about the deaths of those children? What about those grieving families who lost their homes? Seaside height looked like uh, uh, matchboxes in a sandbox. How, how do you, how does, trans, how does salvation translate to them? In other words, you're telling us, David, in a spiritual sense, the spiritual uh, uh, blessings and benefits that we have from Jesus' death on the cross. But what about the practical sense of salvation? Is this microphone working? What about the balance? And so what was revealed through Hebrews is that what Jesus did on the cross didn't stop there. But it continues through the church. Amen, church? It continues through you and I today. Did you all see CNN, the, the, uh, the segment where they feature, uh, uh, who, who later became known as St. Mike? Did you all see this segment? This guy's house was flooded, and he didn't just stew in misery. He decided, I'm going to put on my wetsuit. He was a surfer, and he pulled out this two-seater canoe, got two paddles, and he began to rescue people with his own canoe. And for days, that's all he did, day in and day out, finding people stuck on the top of their roofs. He would rescue them in this two-seater, pull them back to safety, go and find someone else. People stuck on, uh, on the roof of their cars, he would rescue them, old and young. And, and that's what he did throughout. And CNN featured him by calling him St. Mike. So the good news is that salvation does not just end on the cross, but it continues through the church. It continues through your hands and through your feet and through your heart, mind, body, and soul. And so God is now using us, if you will, as agents of change and transformation to reach people while we can. Once again, it's a beautiful transaction involving the taking away of a need and the giving of fulfillment. Don't want you to miss that. It's the taking away of a problem and the giving of a solution. Aren't you glad you saved today? Jesus bore your sins and he took away our sins and gave us salvation. And so as I move along, I just want to share with you three things that really gave me comfort as I was looking at the backdrop of Hurricane Sandy and also the reality of what this text is bringing to light. And here they are. Here they are. Are you ready for them? Here's the first one. Death, my friends, is a certainty. It's a certainty. There are only two accounts in scriptures, uh, uh, in, in Holy Scripture, where men have gone on from uh, earth unto heaven without death. Do you know the two men? Enoch and Elijah. Hebrews 11 and 5, if you want to take notes and research this later, it says in Hebrews 11 and 5, by faith Enoch was taken from life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was, he was commended as one who pleased God. That's Hebrews 11 and 5. And also 2 Kings uh, chapter 2, verse 11, as they were walking. Who was they? Elijah and Elisha. As they were walking along and talking together, suddenly a chariot of, a chariot of fire and horses of fire appeared and separated the two of them. And Eli Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. Did not experience a death. Now... If you are not related to Enoch and Elijah, it's a possibility you're going to die. I, I hate to break that to you that way, but I don't have another way of breaking it to you. We're going to die someday. Death is a certainty. The second thing we find in the text, can you bring up Hebrews 27 and 28? Uh, it says, after death then comes what? At, just as people are destined to die once and after that to face judgment. So death is a certainty. Second point, judgment is a reality. Judgment is a reality. You and I are going to be judged someday. 1 Peter 4 and 17 says it this way, For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. 
And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? Ecclesiastes 12 and 14 says, For God will bring every deed into judgment, and with every secret thing, uh, whether good or evil. One, one last reference here, 2 Corinthians 5 and 10, if you're taking notes. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive what is due him for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Judgment is reality. Death is a certainty. Judgment is a reality. Are you ready for the good news? Come on, are you ready for the good news? Salvation is a possibility. Yes, death is a certainty. Yes, judgment is a reality. Salvation, my friends, it's a possibility. Romans 10 and 9 says what? If you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, you shall be saved. That's a huge if which means it's conditional. It requires action on one, one part. If you confess with your mouth, if you believe in your heart. So salvation is a possibility. It's a possibility that Jesus had, has made available to all who will, who will receive him. That's good news, church. Just as man is destined, destined to die once, and after that to face judgment, verse 28, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many people. And he will appear a second time not to bear sin. He's not going to bear sin again, but he's going to bring salvation. Why isn't he going to bear sin again? He's already bore our sins. Isaiah 53 and 5, he was already wounded for our transgressions. He, he's already been bruised for our iniquities. It's past sins. He's not going to bear them again. But this time when he returns, he's going to be bringing salvation. But here's the catch. For those who are waiting for him. Did you, did you catch that? Verse 28, bringer of salvation for those who are waiting for him. And I was kind of amazed at that word waiting because I went, zeroed into it, and I did the Greek research and the Greek study on it, and here's what I found. The Greek word for wait is apekodekomai, and it means to eagerly wait with expectation. To eagerly wait. I remember when uh, my, 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 my kids were being born and uh, was standing there a little nervous because that was my first time going through it with, with Trinity. And um, I remember in the, you know, the, the, the machine beeping and the nurses around. And uh, when I finally uh, settled down and was no longer nervous and afraid, I began to eagerly wait for her to come forward. Beautiful moment. I remember at the altar with uh, Courtney and the preacher was just taking too long. I was eagerly waiting for her. Y'all will catch it on the way home. Je Je Jesus wants us eagerly waiting for him. You know, I love restaurants where before you even open the door, the waitresses and the waiters are eagerly awaiting. You know how? They're wiping down tables and they're uh, uh, cleaning out the glasses and they're straightening up your table. And uh, uh, they're working, but they're watching because they're eager for your presence, they're eager for your business as well. But they're eagerly watching and waiting. And that's what the scripture is talking about. That's really the genuine meaning of that word wait for those who are waiting. It doesn't mean we're just sitting, but we're serving. We're, we're worshiping God. We're watching, but we're also working as we wait for the return of the Lord. Amen, church? As I transition now into uh, communion, I, uh, my, my barber here in town invited me to be the, the guest speaker at this banquet. They were celebrating 16 years of being in existence as a church, and uh, when I first moved, uh, well, recently I learned about uh, my barber having a, 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 a his dad is a pastor, and was blown away by the things that they're doing on the college campus, and so I've always wanted to meet this guy since hearing so many wonderful stories about him, and finally he invited me to be the guest speaker at their banquet. And so I went and I spoke, and uh, that speaking engagement led to me having a one-on-one, -on -one, well, a, luncheon, a, a lunch with dad. Took Courtney with me. He brought his wife, and Reggie joined us there. And there we are feasting at a table. And it dawns on me, David, the only reason you're feasting with the father is because of your relationship with the son. Did you catch that? Friends, you and I have now access to the heavenly banquet and the highest and the holiest meal, holiest meal of the church, all because of the sacrifice and the relationship through the Son. You and I get to, to, to experience fine wine and dining. 
because of the sacrifice and the relationship that we share with the Son. Will you prepare your hearts and minds with me now to receive Holy Communion? And before we do such, let's just go to the Lord in prayer. God, there may be someone who does not know you personally as Savior and Lord. And we pray wherever they are and whoever they are and whatever they're facing and going through that you'll just give them a few minutes here to contemplate and to think where they are with you. God, we do thank you for your death on the cross. We thank you, O oh God, for giving us deliverance uh, beyond the penalty of sin, the power of sin, and also the practice of sin. And we thank you also that we know death is a certainty and judgment is a reality. But we also know that salvation is a possibility. And we pray that you'll save us all, O oh Lord, that you'll write our names in the Lamb's book of life and keep us there. We do, O oh Lord, eagerly expect and eagerly await your return. And we're doing so by honoring, O oh Lord, your request. You told us as often as we do this, to do this in remembrance of you. And so, Lord, now we thank you for this meal. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.